This podcast features criminologists discussing sensitive themes and topics. Listener discretion is advised. A woman is found stabbed to death in her home. Although the killer is quickly apprehended, a court ruling may put her family's quest for justice on hold. This is the Joanne Cullinan story. I'm Megan. Amy, how you managed to pick these cases that I've never heard of? How we've like how we've been doing this for this many years, and I, I still have no clue. You have a good nose for cases that, like, especially I've never heard of, and based on issues, you're very good that way. Well, this case, it's this case came to us a little different. Okay, this case was actually suggested several years ago by one of our supporters, who happens to be the victim's niece. Oh, so I want to give a shout out to Christine Conklin. You may remember seeing messages from her. I do over the years. Yes, okay. So Christine had reached out a couple of years ago asking us to cover this case. Unfortunately, again, it's her aunt who was the victim here. But I had been holding off covering it because I wanted to wait until the court proceedings were complete. Yes, but I could have never guessed just how long it would take for that to happen. But a lot more on that later. Okay. I actually had the opportunity to view the latest court proceeding. Yes. Okay. Remember I told you I was going to be attending that Zoom. I briefly remember this. Yes. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. Okay. So Christine sent me the link to a court proceeding because some of the stuff is still actually since COVID, I think a lot of court proceedings, it makes it a lot easier for victims and survivors to attend these court proceedings. So I was there and I was very honored to be in attendance and hear from all the loved ones of Joanne. Christine spoke. Um, I was in tears listening to her read her statement about her aunt, Joanne, and that's who we're going to be talking about today. Okay. So let's go ahead and meet the woman at the center of today's story. Joanne was born in 1947 in Brooklyn, New York, but spent most of her childhood in Center Reach, Long Island. Oh my gosh. So many of these stories come back to places we lived so close to. Right. A lot of people from New Jersey and New Long York. Island. Yes. <laughs> Joanne had two sisters and two brothers, and she was smack in the middle. Along with her large immediate family, she also had a very large extended family as her father was one of seven. So she had many aunts and uncles and cousins. And they were a close-knit family. Most of them lived in the tri-state area, and they all spent a ton of time together. Joanne attended a SUNY college and studied to be a rehabilitation counselor. She got married in 1966 and had one son named Sean in 1968. Around 2010, after her husband passed away, Joanne moved to Old Bridge, New Jersey to live closer to one of her sisters, Jerry, and her elderly mother also lived in the area. In fact, her mother lived to almost 100. Oh, wow. Do you know Old Bridge? That's very close to Manalpin, where my mother is. Yeah, I do. And by this point, Joanne had many nieces and nephews, and she doted on all of them. She was known as the fun aunt, and she always had a fun craft to do with them. Joanne was also a very hard worker. She spent most of her career at VESID, which is the Office of Vocational and Educational Services for Individuals with Disabilities. And this is in New York State. Okay. So she worked there as a vocational counselor. And for over 30 years, Joanne worked with disabled individuals. And these are individuals who are both mentally and physically disabled. Okay. She would help these individuals obtain employment and also live independent lives. Mm -hmm. Her family stated that this was a career that she was extremely proud of, as she should have been. And she was well known by her coworkers as someone that would always take on the toughest cases because she had a really unique compassion for people. She always looked for the best in people and tried to help them the best they could, regardless of their circumstances. And everyone who knew Joanne said that she was very passionate about her work and extremely empathetic. And this would extend to her own son as he struggled with addiction as an adult. Oh, okay. Her son, Sean, began living with her around 2012 while he was in treatment. While Sean was working on getting clean, he became good friends with a neighbor named Carolyn. He actually met Carolyn at a substance abuse day program that both of them had attended together. Carolyn lived in low-income housing that was right across from Joanne's home. Okay. Carolyn was in her 40s, somewhere around Sean's age, and the two would sometime hang out at Joanne's home. So Joanne and Carolyn were also friendly. Oh, I see. All right. Around the time of the events we are discussing, she was in her early 70s and looking forward to retirement. 
She had many travel plans with family and friends and just looking forward to you after working so hard for so many years mm -hmm. forward to winding down a bit. However, nothing could have prepared the Cullinan family for what was about to happen. Now, there are two different accounts of how the following events played out. Hmm. There's the media accounts and then what the family says. The information that you're getting from the family, you got directly from Christine. Yes. Christine is also still in touch with her cousin, Sean, and some other family members. Okay. So she spoke with them and then spoke with me. Got it. So first, I'm going to tell you what the media said. Now, the media reported that on May 24th, 2019, the police received a call from a woman. The woman told the police that her friend had called her and said that she had killed someone. Her friend called her and said, all right. Yeah. So her friend called her and said, hey. I just killed someone. And then in response, the friend who was getting this information called the police. And that's how that was the catalyst. That's according to media reports. OK. However, according to the family, things happened a little bit different. And this is probably the more accurate version, considering it came from the family. Probably. Now, that day, it was a Tuesday and Sean wasn't home with Joanne like he normally was because he would often go into the city to take some sort of class. So every Tuesday, he would take the train into the city, and then he would come back the next mm -hmm. day. Okay. So he returned back to Joanne's home in the early afternoon, and he walked into the home where he found his mother lying on the floor. Now, initially, Sean believed that she had died by suicide, so he called 911. Why did he think that? I don't know. I guess that's all he could have imagined hmm. at the time. Uh, and maybe he couldn't see some any obvious injury signs. He just didn't know what to think. Okay. Just by the family's account, his initial reaction was like, that's what he had thought would All happen. Right. Just curious. Yeah. So police arrived on the scene just after 2 p.m., where tragically they found Joanne deceased. More information's coming together, and they determined that she had actually been stabbed and beaten. So this was clearly a murder scene. Mm -hmm. But there was little evidence at the scene. Nothing was missing from the home except for $15. Mm -mm. And Joanne's autopsy would reveal that she'd also been brutally sexually assaulted with an umbrella. Oh. Now, who would do this to a 70-year-old woman? I mean, $15 isn't much of a robbery. No. Would somebody brutally assault and murder a woman over such a small sum? She had no known enemies or any known conflicts in her life. Well, I mean, this is a sexual assault with very severe features as well. So it, it doesn't sound like it's, you know, it's not robbery motivated or uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what yeah. the motivation was. OK. Initially, there's very little evidence at the scene, but the suspect pool was pretty small and it didn't take police long to hone in on Sean's friend, Carolyn Beckert. How did they come to this conclusion? <laughs> well, remember that call I said that the police had received? Yes. Well, it turns out the call was from a friend of Carolyn's. Oh, so okay. while the, right. So it's almost as if the police were being called to Sean's home from his call at the same time or a few hours before they had received a call from a woman that said, Carolyn Becker called me and told me she killed someone. So I think they were able to quickly say, OK, we have a tip from someone saying Carolyn Becker killed someone. And now we have somebody dead that is in the circle of Carolyn Becker. Well, this would be very interesting, too, in terms of a female perpetrated crime mm -hmm. in this this type of crime. OK. Yes. And it wouldn't take police long to put this all together because we would come to find out that after Sean had found his mother, he called Carolyn because she was one of his closest friends and she came over with vodka to stay with him. So she was on the scene pretty early, taking an interest in what happened. Did you say she brought vodka? Yes. Okay, but yes, well. they were in treatment together, though. Right? Uh, okay. Is that why you're questioning well, it? I mean, I guess you might need to calm your nerves or yeah. something. It was just a strange thing. OK. And yeah, they, they were in treatment. So, yeah. All right. It turns out she also posted a few photos to her Instagram that morning that showed items from Joanne's home. And some of the photos may have actually been taken in Joanne's home. Hmm. Joanne, she was very crafty. So she would make dioramas in old drawers, like uh, dresser drawers. Didn't we have another case in which you said someone made dioramas? Maybe. but I feel, Or I was just talking about this with someone recently because I loved them. You know what it made me think of? You ever hear of that woman who recreated crime scenes yes. by making um, little, I don't That's know if they were the, called dioramas. It was in that book. The book. Yes. Savage Appetites. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yep, yep, yep. The police did not have to work hard here. They actually didn't really have to do much because Carolyn was ready to talk and volunteered all the information police needed to make an arrest. What? In fact, she even led police to several dumpsters around town where they recovered a knife, a bloody umbrella, and piles of bloody clothes. Oh. And perhaps the most shocking, Carolyn readily admitted to the police that she did, in fact, sexually assault Joanne with the umbrella. 
So they got this information even before the autopsy report revealed it. And directly from her. Mm -hmm. This is a confession, okay? A few personal items of Joanne's were also recovered. So police had plenty of evidence, but I think this begs the question, like, what Why? was the motive? Yeah, I mean, right? I, I'm sitting here and I was going to try to be patient, but yes. Is there any known tension, arguments, hostility? Is this a revenge be between the women? Just out of curiosity. That's a good question. So as I briefly mentioned earlier, the two seem to have a pretty friendly relationship because her son was, they were pretty, her son and Carolyn were fairly close friends and the woman spent a decent amount of time at the home. So family and friends were perplexed because they didn't really know of any issues between the two women. However, it would come to light that Carolyn had some anger towards Joanne. Oh, okay. I was going to ask if Carolyn had any issues with her own mother or a female figure in her life. Interesting. Thinking like a true criminologist. Uh, so th there were a few circumstances that revealed a little bit of anger between the two women. For one, the week before the murder, Carolyn had kicked over some of Joanne's potted plants at her home. Now, this was apparently a response to a very minor disagreement. So it sounds like it's perhaps a disproportionate response to stimuli. I don't know. You might say that. Well, you would say that if, if, yeah. that is the, if that's really the motive, yeah. but okay. So at this time, Joanne had allegedly told Carolyn that she would not be welcome back at the home if she continued to behave like that. Mm -hmm. It's also possible that Carolyn kicked over the plants in response to some other anger. Of course. It yeah. might not have had anything to do with Joanne. Of course. There was also another occasion where Carolyn reportedly felt disrespected by Joanne. Again, for something possibly minor, but I don't know what Carolyn's triggers were. And I was going to ask, do we, are we going to find out about her own history of violence, family history Well, stuff? unfortunately, very little is known about Carolyn's background. Mm. I can tell you that she had very few social bonds. She was estranged from her family. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe she really had many friends besides Sean. As mentioned, she also struggled with substance abuse and she did have a known history of mental health issues as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are a lot of factors on the board mm -hmm. here. Carolyn Beckett was arrested and charged with first degree murder, aggravated sexual assault, and second degree possession of a weapon for an unlawful purpose. Besides the shock, horror, and absolute devastation at Joanne's murder, her family was still left wondering, why would Carolyn have done this? Again, what possible motive? Nobody could imagine that a minor disagreement would lead to this. Also, keep in mind that Joanne's son was one of Carolyn's only friends. Yeah. And Joanne was one of the only people that accepted Carolyn into her home. Mm. It's such a violation to the sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And to my knowledge, Carolyn did not have a history of violent or criminal behavior, but I can tell you that she was being supervised. In fact, the morning of the murder, there was a welfare check at her apartment and there was no concerns raised. Okay. So maybe she was under mental health supervision. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest issues in this case was the many delays that the family experienced in trying to get justice for Joanne. As we have seen with countless other cases, COVID slowed things down. Mm-hmm. The family didn't get their day in court until early March of 2024. That's five years after the murder. Yeah, I, we've heard of cases that move this slow, though. It's very upsetting for the family, but I'm not as shocked yes. as maybe a, a yeah. one could be. Yeah, it's also upsetting because that was the first time that the family was able to read their statements and honor their loved one. It's a long time for a family. And in the end... There wasn't even a trial because Carolyn Beckert pled not guilty by reason of insanity and she was giving NGRI status. Wow, you're kidding. Yes, shocking, right? And the reason why you're saying you're kidding is because most people don't know, but not guilty by reason of insanity is such a rare verdict. So rare. You see different estimates, but typically most reports say it's only used in about 1% of all court cases, and it's only successful in about a quarter of that 1% of cases. It's so rare. It's it's just, it's there's a misconception about it, I think. Yes. But what was the actual, because insanity uh -huh. is the legal term, yes. what was the underlying condition? Okay, so we'll get there. So first, right. I'll tell you that the defense argued that at the time of the criminal act, Carolyn was unable to appreciate the nature and quality or wrongfulness of her conduct due to severe mental disease or defect. Now, again, this is known as the insanity defense. Yes. And this is basically based on the principle that people who lack the mental capacity to understand the consequences of their actions or tell right from wrong 
should not be punished in the same way as those who intentionally commit crimes. Mm -hmm. And I tend to agree with that. Yeah. And again, this is where we get not guilty by reason of insanity, also known as NGRI. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know this, but there are actually four states that do not even allow the insanity defense. Yeah, I did know this okay. because I teach it in policy. You do. But okay. now I couldn't tell you which states are okay. hand, but so yes. I can because I did my research. Yeah, um, of course. Kansas, Montana, Idaho, and Utah. Okay. So other than those states, every other state allows some sort of insanity defense. Mm -hmm. But as you know, the standards for approving this defense vary widely. So those states have guilty but mentally ill, I wonder, you know, because that's the different standard, guilty but mentally ill, which still means that you're going to be incarcerated. So it's not really a differentiator. Well, guilty but mentally ill is interesting. Very few states have that. And we I do spend a little bit of time talking about that when we get into kind of the aftermath or policies implications. Here. Oh, OK. Since this murder occurred in New Jersey, I just want to tell you a little bit about New Jersey's standard mm -hmm. for insanity. So New Jersey follows what's known as the McNaughton. McNaughton. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I know you know that. Right, and our students ahead. better know that because I think we both teach that. <laughs> and anyone who's taken any class in criminal justice probably know that. The McNaughton Rule for Insanity is a two-pronged test that was established in 1843 in England. Under McNaughton, a defendant can be found not guilty by reason of insanity if it is shown that at the time of their crime, they were laboring under such a defect of reason due to mental disease that they did not know the nature and quality of the act. Or if they did, they did not know what they were doing was wrong. Andrea Yates' case, we had a big discussion about this. Uh, yes, it was a supporter case, Andrea okay. Yates. Okay, so, so Andrea Yates, we did cover and we broke this down a lot. The insanity defense is what's known as an affirmative defense. Basically, that means you're saying, yes, I did it, but enter McNaughton standards, right? So the burden here is on the defendant to prove that they were insane at the time of the defense. In other words, the defendant must establish insanity but they had to do so by a preponderance of the evidence. Mm -hmm. So not beyond a reasonable doubt. I talk about this with my students, but beyond a reasonable doubt is like 98 to 99% certain mm -hmm. where preponderance of the evidence just simply means that you must prove something is more likely than not. Yeah. So we're talking more like 51%. Yeah, just or a little bit more sure 50. than not. 50.1%. Much lower standard. And that's the standard used in civil cases Correct. in the United States. Yeah. Now, a verdict of guilty by reason of insanity does not necessarily mean that the defendant or the accused will be free, nor does it mean that the individual will be indefinitely committed to a mental institution. Mm -hmm. So who decides this? Well, in New Jersey, like most states, it's left to the court to decide. Mm -hmm. In other words, the court has to have further hearings, among other matters, to determine a few things. They need to determine whether or not the defendant's insanity continues to be present. Because remember, insanity is mental state at the time of the crime. Mm -hmm. So you could be insane then, but perfectly fine now. So they need to look at the uh, current state and whether or not the defendant poses a danger to the community or a danger to themselves. And this is the hearing that I attended. Oh, OK. Yep. Got it. So the hearing I attended is when the court's trying to decide, OK, now we know you're not guilty by reason of insanity, but what should we do with you? Yeah. Pretty much. So interesting. Very interesting. It was the final court proceeding where the family, again, was finally given a chance to read their victim impact statements. And usually this is done at sentencing. But in this type of case where there's a not guilty by reason of insanity plea that's accepted, you know, things are a little bit different because there's not really a sentencing in a case like this. Right. Because they're not found criminally responsible. Yep. So this is where it would be determined if Carolyn was still, quote, insane and whether or not she posed a danger to the community or to herself. When I spoke to the family, they were told like, oh, she'll be put away for 30 years. They're not going to talk about this for a while. Basically, the judge said that the case can be reviewed again in the future to determine dangerousness. As of now, it was decided that Carolyn would be committed as a way to protect the public. In other words, as of this hearing that I attended, it was decided that she would be civilly committed. So defined by the United States Health and Human Services, civil commitment is also known as involuntary hospitalization of a patient. Mm hmm. Now, th this means until such time where she is restored yes. to sanity. Yeah. So basically, this means that a person is being held against their own wishes mm -hmm. in a mental health facility because of a treatable mental disorder until right. the point where it is determined that they are no longer mentally ill. Now, there's some ethical issues when we talk about civil commitment. While civil commitment aims to improve the well-being of an individual and mm -hmm. protect a community, it also raises some difficult questions about some core ethical issues such as autonomy, 
in the sense that, you know, should people have the right to make medical decisions on their own? Again, if someone's insane at that time, that doesn't mean that they can't make their own decisions now. And also this idea of undue harm. Like we want to always ensure that interventions provide more benefit than harm. Mm -hmm. You probably talk about that ad nauseum in policy, right? I do. Well, not ad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I heard. I'm yeah, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I talk about it enough. Sure. Okay. So this begs the question, if slash when will Carolyn be considered for release from a forensic hospital? Mm. Now, this is the tricky part because New Jersey does something different than other states. Okay. In New Jersey, a person acquitted of a crime by reason of insanity who is thereafter involuntarily committed because of danger to themselves or others, they are classified as someone being on Kroll status. So it's known as a Kroll commitment. And this is K-R-O-L. And it's my understanding that Kroll status is unique to New Jersey because I did not see any other states that have Kroll status. So what this means is the behavioral health treatment of a person found not guilty by reason of insanity is monitored by a civil court and they issue orders regarding involuntary confinement at a facility, discharge planning and community reintegration. The issue is there is no timeline or information given to the family about how long this will be. Okay. Now, this Kroll status came after a 1975 court decision that involved a man named Stefan Kroll who had stabbed his wife to death and he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. So after that case, New Jersey does what's known as Kroll hearings. The primary purpose is to determine if it is still fair to keep an individual civilly committed and to also gauge their dangerousness. Now, this is good policy. Because sometimes civilly committing someone can turn into an extreme violation of an individual's rights. Sure. I mean, that, there's a big argument about it when they commit sex offenders, civil commitment after sex offenders have finished serving their sentences. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes it's almost like people forget about them. They're civilly committed and people don't even think like, oh, should we reexamine? Are they OK now? Because the idea isn't it shouldn't be indefinite. But how is this different than other states? Because in other states, the insanity defense, I mean, if you're found guilty, it's the same thing. I mean, you're, you're not given a sentence. You don't get 30 years. You get sentenced to a facility until such time when you're sane again. I think the unique thing here is that judges who release the criminal suspects who are found not guilty by reason of insanity, they must monitor those suspects' progress. So in other words, civil commitment is a civil issue, right? It's not a criminal court issue because you're found not guilty by reason of insanity. Yeah, okay. So it becomes a civil issue. But in New Jersey, it's the criminal judge who is almost overseeing this process. They're the person who is charged with monitoring the suspect's progress and deciding whether or not they should be released. So from what I understand, when the Kroll statuses were implemented in 1975, New Jersey's high court was the first to explicitly address whether judges must require suspects to return for courts for periodic review after being conditionally released. Oh, OK. It's not so different, yeah. but it's a little more. All right. It, put it this way. It's more formal than other states. OK. All right. That's OK. Fine. One other difference is in other states, when people are ordered to mental health institutions for evaluation and treatment, Sometimes they go back for review. Sometimes they don't. Like, so it's just, again, I think it just formalizes the process a little bit. At this hearing, though, the judge who was in charge of this hearing said that it would come back before the court in 20 years. And he made it a note to tell everyone in the court that he certainly will not be the one to be doing that. <laughs> Wait, so he's actually stating it can't come back for 20 years? That's And this is where, and when I spoke to Christine, I was like, did I hear that correctly? Because none of this is making sense. She's like, as the family, we don't understand this at all. So basically this judge said, all right, well, you know, she'll be civilly committed and this will be reexamined in 20 years, at which point I will no longer be the one in charge of this case. And we're like, what? It, it was very, it was so very it confusing. Is that the difference then? In other states, there is no required time to wait. If you're restored to sanity within six months, you're restored. Well, Could that be one of the significant differences in formalizing this? No, because she had already had a hearing just a few months later. In I'm other so words, confused. the family was told 20 years and within six months, Carolyn had a hearing. Now, there's a ton of discretion on the part of the judge, but should they be the only one making this decision? And this is a big decision when to release someone. Of course, they're doing it with the input of mental health professionals, but it seems like a lot to put on a judge. I almost think there should be like the way you have a parole board or some sort of board where people can evaluate the case. In other states, it would have to be the psychiatric team. Yes. 
that would have to, you know, make the recommendation. I assume it's the same thing. I yeah, mean, but judges have a lot of power because they can outright release the person who is found not guilty by reason of insanity. They can release a suspect at any point. So the judge could wake up one day and say, OK, you're done. Like, it just seems like there's not strict criteria. I see. OK, got it. Joanne's family, as Christine told me, they do not feel that justice has been served with this ruling. For one, the case came back before a judge in just a few months, nowhere close to the 20 years that the family was told by the initial judge. It doesn't make sense. No. Furthermore, at another recent hearing in June of 2024, Carolyn was given the opportunity to address the court and speak about her condition. Now, she said she was doing very well and everyone seemed to be pleased with how things were progressing, but she did not have any remorse at all and did not even mention the victim in the case. Are you going to talk about the motive ever? <laughs> Megan, this is the problem. And nobody knows. So Carolyn made a full confession. She made a full com confession. But she but didn't state Anything indicating she, why she did not state why, nor has she ever addressed the family or shown any remorse for what she did. I'm so bothered now. And at this hearing, it was also revealed that Carolyn had undergone four different evaluations and they all concluded that she was competent and sane, but displayed some signs of mental illness. So they're saying at this point, she is competent and sane by a legal standard but she is showing signs of mental illness. So overall, it was reported that due to her good behavior and her improved condition, that she could be considered for a downgrade, which would essentially mean that she could be moved to a less secured facility and thereafter sooner released into the public. Again, a far cry from the family's expectations. From the beginning, they were led to believe that she would be institutionalized for decades. And here we are months later talking about her being downgraded and eventually released. Now, Christine told me that her and her family are very aware that Carolyn can't be held criminally responsible given the verdict, not guilty by reason of insanity. However, they are still shocked and outraged over the prospect of her returning to society in the near future. And one of the most, I think, frustrating parts of this is that the family have to keep tabs on it. They won't be notified. They don't seem to have a victim's advocate or somebody who is going to be letting them know the way in the criminal system families are notified of yeah. parole hearings. Yeah. The family is not being notified. They have to actually seek out the information themselves. Because this is a civil matter? Yes. Okay. And the next parole hearing is scheduled for December 7th of 2024. So again, happening so much sooner. The family was led to believe it would the first one wouldn't happen for 20 years. And now we have two of them happening within six months. I've almost never been as confused as I am by one of your cases, and I, I just don't understand what's going on. But maybe that's because when I teach insanity, I teach it as a general concept and, you know, the majority of states and how they do it. But mm -hmm. I, I really didn't know that this was the way New Jersey did it. I really didn't. I feel like I have so much more to learn on this. And I know you did a lot of research for it, too. But it seems like you kind of don't like you're kind of confused by some of this, too. No, I am pretty confused by this. I'm also I also feel for the family because they are extremely confused. When I told Christine, I'm so confused. And she said, yes. Imagine and you're, being us. You know, you're an expert in this field. Imagine us. We don't understand how this is working, why this is working. And I actually, I asked Christine, I said, so what would justice actually look like for your family? Yeah. And she had a really interesting suggestion. She said that the verbiage should be changed to guilty but insane, which is similar to guilty but mentally ill, as we mentioned before. So guilty but mentally ill is a verdict that allows a jury or a court to find a mentally ill defendant criminally liable while simultaneously requiring that they receive psychiatric treatment while incarcerated. Mm. In these cases, a defendant may be placed in a forensic hospital until they are well enough to serve their sentence in a prison. Now, as Christine explained, this would be better for families. It, was, it would provide a lot more justice mm -hmm. and meaning to victims and survivors because then at least they would feel that there's some retribution. We still don't know. I'm sorry. Do we still not know what the underlying condition that triggered the insanity finding was? No, and neither does Christine. How? In other words, in, in other words, your question is: Is she schizophrenic? Does yes. she have schizoaffective? Yes. Is she? Uh, did she suffer from psychosis? Did she suffer like I just, PTSD? I want to know. I think Christine's family would like to know as well. How is it possible that nobody knows what? condition or disorder or i'm just okay i'm super perplexed by that as well so yeah, many questions and so a case like this of course the frustration for the family here is just all of these unknowns 
But I think this brings up the interesting question of, you know, what should be done in a case like this? Because I think most of us would agree that if somebody is mentally ill by the McNaughton two-prong test, then Mm -hmm. they should not be held criminally liable. However, they're still a victim and the victim has to be acknowledged. And in this situation, it's not clear, at least to the public, us being the public, what went on in this case as far as, remember I said she was being treated for some, I believe she was being treated for some mental health issue. Mm -hmm. She had someone do a welfare check that day. Mm -hmm. So it brings up all these questions like, what, what were they tracking her for? Why was she having these home visits? And they said that she seemed stable that day, but stable from what? Like, was she on medication? I don't know any of this. I don't know where the transparency is here. I feel like there's no transparency. And I think that at the very least, that's what the victim's family is owed. They yes. should know what's happening. Yes. They should be kept informed according to a victim bill of rights. They should be notified of hearings. And I'm not mm-hmm. sure why these things aren't happening. It just seems that not guilty by reason of insanity does not provide closure to victims. So you have to think like, how can we provide closure to victims while simultaneously not punishing people who shouldn't be held accountable due to mental illness or defect? It's a really tricky question. Another complexity in these types of cases is that once someone is found not guilty by reason of insanity, again, they are no longer under criminal courts. It's a civil issue. And as a result, the individual is not an offender. They actually start being treated like a victim. And Christine said it is so infuriating to sit through these hearings and to see that her loved one, Joanne, is no longer even in the conversation. She is not a consideration and the focus is primarily on Carolyn's rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And during the hearing, the family continuously heard the words acquitted and not guilty, not responsible, diminishing the fact that somebody murdered their loved one. Right. So the language around it was also as harmful. This case is so important because it brings these issues to light. The family should be taken into consideration. There needs to be a way in which the victim can be honored and the family be considered and respected while getting somebody the help they need. There has to be a way we can restore the victims as well. This is one of the core tenets of restorative justice. It's not just that somebody is punished. Somebody is Not, but there's a way to include victims and their family members Mm -hmm. and secondary victims Mm -hmm. in the process so that they actually feel Mm -hmm. like there is help for them and there's some type of restoration Mm -hmm. for them as well. Yeah, for the loved ones that have to sit through these hearings where the person who took the life of their loved one is the one being treated as a victim in a sense, the one being offered help. They're not being offered victim services, but the person who killed their loved one is being offered many services. How can we help you reintegrate? How can we help you reintegrate into the community when that time comes? So she's getting a lot of support. I'm not saying we shouldn't give support to people in Carolyn's situation, but if we're going to do that, we should be giving support to victims and their families as well. I mean, I agree. I agree. I can't imagine what it would be like to be Joanne's family in Mm -hmm. this situation. How upset and frustrated they must be. They are, and they don't know what to do. And Christine asked me, what can we do? And I said, I don't know. know But I said, at the very least, we can provide a platform. We can inform people that this actually, these things actually happen, that when someone is found not guilty by reason of insanity, it has lasting effects on victims and survivors. And there has to be a way that we can be more supportive in our system. Oh, my gosh. And I want to thank Christine and her family for sharing Joanne's story and providing all the missing pieces for today's story. Because without Christine's input, there'd be no episode. There's so little public information on not only this case, but on the processes involved in these types of cases. I'm left with more questions and I feel more questions than answers Mm -hmm. in the end. And I feel irritated. Mm -hmm. I'm not even a family member. Yeah, it's awful for any family to have to deal with this while grieving a loved one. So again, thank you to Christine for reaching out and letting us know about this and also sharing your story. And we hope that, you know, people have gotten some new information out of today's case. Megan, one more thing before we head out. I know we're left with so many questions because we don't have the information. We don't have much information about Carolyn's background. Right. We, We don't know motive. But when we look at cases where there is female-on-female sexual assault, Mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier something interesting you were questioning um, about whether or not she might have seen Joanne as a mother figure. Mm -hmm. 
I did see some information, or maybe Christine had mentioned it somewhere along the way that perhaps Carolyn uh, was sexually abused mm-hmm. at some point. Yeah. So that might have something, maybe it's some sort of revenge in her mind. It could definitely have been that. I was thinking also the manner in which she was assaulted and the object that was used is also like, it's it's anger, but it's a form of degradation. Mm-hmm. Um, so lack of respect and really trying to degrade a victim. So mm-hmm. I wondered if it wasn't something, and I, I, don't, I don't mean it has to necessarily mm-hmm. be her own mother, but if it, you know, given the age, mm-hmm. something didn't trigger a, a past female in her life yeah. with whom she associated. Uh, and that's, that's what why- I was thinking. I, I mean, that, but I thought, Amy, you were going to tell me that I was right or wrong um, in the end of I this. I wish and, I had more information. Yeah. And when we look at the circumstances surrounding the case, from what we know, I think it is also possible that this was not premeditated. It's possible that Carolyn went over there maybe looking for Sean or maybe for whatever reason. And then maybe there was an altercation Mm -hmm. because the weapons used against Joanne were all weapons that were or items that were in Joanne's home already. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. Where the umbrella was. Okay. So as far as I understand it. Um, she was beaten with one of those drawers that I told you, like the diorama drawers that she made, and that oh. was already in that was already in Joanne's home. And the weapon was in, uh, the, sorry, the knife was in her home that she was stabbed with. That I'm not positive, but I'm almost positive the umbrella was there. Okay, if the if all those items were there, you're right. You you did mention that, but if the knife was there as well, it's something we hadn't considered. I know you're yeah. not sure about it, but then yeah. it would change. Mm-hmm. The motivation, it would probably lessen the likelihood at all that it was premeditated and that there wasn't some type of trigger, yeah. like a rage, especially a rage revenge um, type yeah. of killing. Yeah, because if Carolyn had mental health issues, maybe yeah. she was on substances, maybe Joanne said something that to most people wouldn't be triggering. Mm-hmm. But to Carolyn, it incited something within her. It's possible. And also the fact that she called a friend and said, I just killed someone. You know, you have to think about what kind of person that's right. somebody who maybe doesn't appreciate the wrongfulness of their act. That's not somebody. But she did hide the weapons. Right. So if you're going to dispose of weapons, then to me, that signals that, you know, you did something wrong because you're hiding stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. When we see other cases of people who are not guilty by reason of insanity, these are people that are just like, oh, yeah, I just killed someone because they are the devil or somebody who's clearly doesn't know the wrongfulness of their actions. I don't see that here. Part of the insanity defense in some places is not understanding the wrongfulness of your actions only, but there is a different standard, and that is whether or not you can conform your behavior. Yes. So like Andrea Yates knew that her behavior was wrong, but just could not help it. And that Mm -hmm. was, you know, or that was the way it was deemed in the courts. Yes. So it's not just knowing, it's being able to actually conform your behavior to that, um, which is very complicated for some people or or for maybe even the public to understand. Well, how, if you know it's wrong, how could you not conform your behavior? That's interesting. Yeah. So in this, based on the little bit we know. Right. And like I said, there's so little public information Mm because I think a lot of the information sealed, at least at the mental health side of things, Mm -hmm. as far as Carolyn's case goes. But from the little bit that we know, it does seem like there must be something else that we don't know in order for the court to grant this very rare verdict. We've seen cases where not guilty by reason of insanity is not granted. And there is so much more evidence that is leaning in favor of that verdict. You know, we might not understand all the reasons here either, but I would like to see at the very least, like I said, transparency that Joanne's family is included in this process and simply informed of decisions when they are made, if it's possible, the rationale behind them. I really think if they were just at least included in the process, that they would at least feel more respected. Yes. And feel that Joanne was more respected. Are you talking about procedural justice? I am talking about You know about how much I love procedural you know. justice. Not even opening that can of worms, but yes, that's exactly what I am talking about. Yeah. And I, I really think it's something as maybe, you know, that does not seem mm-hmm. so huge mm-hmm. um, to others. But yes, it's that important to include mm-hmm. people in the yeah. process. And I also think in this case, before they downgrade Carolyn or move her, I think she needs to show some remorse. Oh, my gosh. I think this is an example where restorative justice might be, you know how they have those restorative justice circles? Yes. I think this is the kind of case where I think the family would get a lot of value out of sitting down with Carolyn, who is now no longer, quote, insane, Yeah. who can talk to them about why she did what she did or why she doesn't know what she did, or she could even talk about the last moments, whatever it may be. The fact that 
Joanne's name is not even being considered in yeah. these hearings. I don't understand how we don't release people from prison until they uh, on parole until they show remorse. But in this situation, they're not making Carolyn take any responsibility or acknowledge what she did. I would have to agree. Yeah, yeah I would have to agree completely. Yeah. I and mean, I hope for the sake of Christine and her family that they do get justice or closure, whatever that means to them. And hopefully New Jersey will maybe rethink how they treat victims and survivors in some of these cases. I certainly hope so. I, I really do I hope somebody is listening who yeah. has some type of input or influence here. And yes. I hope just discussing this case mm -hmm. helps in some yes. way. And if you are someone who has some insight as to what the family could do, please reach out to us and I could put you in touch with Christine and her family. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, we could make things happen a little bit. Thank you, Amy. Megan, before we close out today, we do have one supporter question. Okay. Serious or lighthearted, Amy? Um, this one is lighthearted, which, you know, sometimes it's hard to pivot, but okay. we're hoping that Christine's family does get the justice that they are looking for. So I'm ending it on a hopeful note. Okay. All right. So the question we have today is, what is your favorite way to unwind after a long day? I think it would be more fun if I do you and you do me. Yeah. <laughs> well, happy hour. <laughs> Sorry for both of us. Okay. Probably a glass of wine for both of us and yes. good food. Yeah. I also, I need a little quiet if possible. How do you get that in your house? I don't. I'm saying I need it. I'd prefer it. <laughs> it, de it depends on what the day was like, right? But for me, unwinding means end of the day. Oh, okay. I want to read my book. I was going to say After my wine. I was going to point yeah. out, you like to be in bed early and you love to have half an hour to read. Yes. Yeah, and now that the fall. kids are getting older, yeah. they go to sleep yeah. late and I get I start getting really cranky. And I, I like last night I told Jordan, I was like, listen, I don't want to get cranky with you, but yeah. you know what I need. Yeah. And it's 930. And this is my time. <laughs> this is my, this is me time. And I'm like, if you want to get in bed next to me and with your book, that's fine. Oh, but, that's nice. But we're not talking. I'm going to read my book. You do you. I do me. <laughs> I like, well, you like to read. I read also yeah. all the time, but I will actually read during the day if I can, like, or if I, I can. never do. Yeah, if yeah. I can block. Well, you, I can block out. Yeah. I used to be able to. Now that I have <laughs> an infant we'll say, or a newborn, we'll see. But um, for me, I always like, even in bed or in front of the TV, just yeah. a half an hour to an hour of television, like a documentary, whatever it is. I'm watching mm -hmm. a great British show now that I've absolutely loved. It's called yeah. Unforgotten about missing people and the oh. investigation of the cases. It's so good. So I like that. Oh. But also glass yeah. of wine. <laughs> Actually, some one other thing I like doing, and I realize this is like my nighttime ritual. I have two little journals I have to write in every night. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And if I don't do that, it's like, you know, if I don't get to read my book, I could. I think I can go to sleep. But you can't. But I can't go to sleep unless I write my things. I forgot it when I went to Japan, and it was it was very difficult for me. I forgot my journal. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's right. I knew that about you as well. All right. Thank you for an aunt. You know what? After a hard episode, sometimes it's nice to have something a little bit lighter to transition us out. So thank you for that question. Yes. All right. Well, thank you all so much for listening today, and we hope you'll join us next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer is James Varga. Script editing is by Abigail Bel Castro. Audio editing is by Siler Burr and Jose Alfonso. And music is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to follow and leave a review. You can also support the show through Patreon, where you can get access to additional ad-free content such as exclusive full-length episodes, lectures, a book club, and virtual happy hours with Megan and Amy. For more information, visit patreon.com slash women and crime. Sources for today's episode include lawandcrime.com, njcourts.gov, NBC, nj.com, mycentraljersey.com, Psychology Today, The Family's Victim Impact Statements, and Email and Phone Correspondence with Christine Conklin.